Hey everyone, how's it going? Today we're going to be talking about a horrible tragedy, a mass death event born out of fog of war, negligence, and quite possibly evil intent. To set the stage, we start our story in May 1945 in Germany. Hitler at this point is now dead in his bunker, Karl Donitz is now the leader of Germany, and Allied forces are swarming Germany from all sides. To put it bluntly, the jig is up for the remaining shell of the Nazi government, and on May 8, 1945, Donitz and thus Nazi Germany would surrender unconditionally to Allied forces, ending the European theater of World War II. Before the surrender, though, the surviving Nazi officials and officers would attempt to escape capture by Allied forces and thus escape any kind of criminal prosecution for their actions during the war. Some also sought to hide their identity to make it seem like they were just a lowly soldier or something or just a normal civilian, thus evading any kind of punishment they would have received otherwise. However, Allied intelligence forces knew of these plans through the interception of orders from the smoldering remains of the German government, both literally and figuratively smoldering at this point, and through British ultra-interception of German radio communications. It was also known to the Allies that the likes of Heinrich Himmler and various SS men and concentration camp commanders were in the city of Flensburg located just on the border between Germany and Denmark, as that's where the new German government was now located. The plan for Himmler and many high-ranking Germans at this time was to find some way to flee and avoid any retribution. Himmler himself would temporarily escape capture by forging his identification papers with the name Heinrich Hisinger, which is not a very creative name change there, but whatever. He would later be detained by former Soviet POWs on May 21st, before then being taken in by the British on May 23rd. A more successful example of this is of Josef Mengele, who was shockingly released after the Allies captured him due to just general organizational problems that led to him not being recognized as the war criminal that he was. After his release, he would go under the name of Fritz Hallmann and stayed in Germany for the next four years, working as a farmhand, before then fleeing to Argentina in July 1949 and successfully evading any future captures for the rest of his life. However, the stories of those that fled and tried to flee is for another time. Today we're talking about something adjacent to that. So back to the topic for today, with Allied intelligence aware of the German leadership's plans to flee Germany and escape capture, the Allies believed that they would make their escape to Norway via sea. In the nearby waters of Lübeck Bay, located about 150 kilometers southeast of Flensburg, on May 2, 1945, various unmarked German ships were present, various passenger ocean liners and cargo ships. It was believed that high-ranking Germans would use these ships in the bay to flee to Norway. In this belief, there would be at least three ships sunk by Royal Air Force Hawker Typhoon fighter bombers on May 3, 1945. These ships were the SS Cap Arcona, the SS Deutschland, and the SS Thielbeck. In the attack, the vast majority of those on the Cap Arcona and the Thielbeck would not survive, but, rather amazingly, everyone on the Deutschland would survive. RAF pilot Alan Wise would later recall the scene of people fleeing the sinking Cap Arcona, where then he and others in his squadron used their plane's machine guns to fire on those alive and floating in the water. So all said and done, the RAF killed a bunch of SS men and high-ranking Nazis. Not a bad day's work. A job done, right? Well, as you've probably already guessed, there's a bit of a dark turn in the story here. A turn that happened, more than likely, because someone in the RAF failed to pass on some information to the pilots that they really, really should have known. On some of those ships were SS men, that much is true, but there were others, and quite a lot of others, in fact. You see, in their hasty retreat away from the Allied advances, the Germans weren't just taking their own men and belongings with them. 
they were bringing something else along with them. They were bringing people with them. And those people happened to be concentration camp prisoners. So, why were the Germans bringing concentration camp prisoners with them? Well, it's likely that they wanted to try and cover their tracks in a way, take all the prisoners with them to hide the fact that they had imprisoned and mistreated all of these people. It's also possible that it was part of their general plan to ensure that all those people they imprisoned were wiped off the face of the earth. The Allies were advancing rapidly, and the Germans had little time to really plan things out properly, so they moved the prisoners to a more secure area and just figure things out later, I guess. In this mass retreat, prisoners from various camps all over Europe were transferred to camps like the Neuengamme camp in northern Germany. From here, it was allegedly initially planned that these prisoners would be transported to the small island of Femarn or up to Norway, where new camps would be formed. In this endeavor, around 5,000 prisoners were relocated to the lower decks of the Cap Arcona ship, around 3,000 were moved to the lower decks of the Thielbeck, and around 2,000 were moved to the Deutschland. Of course, on all these ships, there were a number of SS men, guards, and sailors. However, due to the rapid advances of the Allied forces, plans would change. Instead of moving these thousands of prisoners to new unformed camps up north, the decision was made, according to the testimonies of former SS men, that the ships would be intentionally sunk by German forces with all the prisoners on board, either by U-boat or Luftwaffe strikes. It seems like they really knew that the end was here and simply wanted to use their remaining time for one last hurrah of terror and violence. But, as it would happen, the Germans never got to enact this part of the plan as the RAF beat them to the punch. So how did the RAF accidentally beat them to the punch like this? As it turns out, the RAF pilots attacking and sinking these ships was, in the end, the result of a lack of proper communication. The day before, on May 2nd, 1945, members of the Red Cross office in Lübeck, as the port city functioned as a designated Red Cross port, that allowed the transfer of goods, mail, and other things to POWs, they would inform British intelligence that the ships located in the bay contained thousands of concentration camp prisoners. However, for whatever reason, this information was not passed through to the RAF commanders or their pilots. To the RAF, these ships were still escape ships, housing fleeing Nazi officials and SS men. This led to the RAF attacking the ships without any real care, and the results were tragic. On the Cap Arcona, several hundred SS men and women on board would manage to escape, but the prisoners all located below deck were not so lucky. Of the roughly 5,000 prisoners on board, just around 350 of them would survive. To make matters worse, in some cases, surviving prisoners who managed to reach the shore would then be quickly killed by German soldiers. Something rather similar actually already occurred earlier during the loading of the ships as the Cap Arcona was at full capacity. Several hundred prisoners that were intended to be loaded on the Cap Arcona were instead shot where they stood. Over on the Deutschland, somehow everybody survived, but over on the Thielbeck, of the roughly 3,000 prisoners present, just around 50 of them would survive. For the next few weeks and even decades, the emaciated bodies of prisoners would wash up on shore and then were collected and buried in a mass grave. As late as 1971, skeletal fragments of dead prisoners would wash up on the shore from time to time. But if you understand how the Red Cross operates in war, then surely the pilots would have been able to identify the ships as Red Cross-affiliated ships, correct? After all, all planes, boats, vehicles, trains, buildings, etc. affiliated with the Red Cross were marked as such to prevent attacks on them, so weren't the ships marked? As you may recall from me saying earlier, no. These ships were not marked as being Red Cross vessels. 
The Deutschland was marked on a single one of its funnels with a Red Cross on a singular side, but the other two ships were completely unmarked. Thus, without the proper information and with the ships not really having the proper markings, the pilots of the RAF simply didn't know what they were actually doing. When they were bombing those ships, they thought they were attacking Nazi leaders. When they were firing on those flailing in the water, they thought they were killing SS men and not innocent prisoners. But still, though, the RAF basically did the Nazis' dirty work for them. Part of me does think that the Germans intentionally didn't paint the ships so that they were more likely to be attacked and sunk without them having to actually take the time to do so, hence my reference to evil intent at the beginning of the video. More than likely, it was because they didn't really have the time or resources to repaint the ships, but still, it does absolutely sound like something the Nazis would do. And on one final note, the British documents relating to the incident still apparently haven't been made public, and they will be declassified in 2045, a full century after the initial event. So I guess this story isn't really over yet, and I guess I'll see you in 2045 when that new hot info drops. If the world hasn't been destroyed by nuclear war or something. And so on that note, that's where I'll go ahead and end the video. So thank you all for watching. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe, and ring the bell and stuff. Christmas is next week, so how fun is that? Everybody gets a day off and you get presents from Santa. What's not to like? I'm going to try and release my next video on Christmas Eve or Christmas, which is a Saturday or Sunday, I believe. And it will be a Christmas-related video, a Christmas topic anyway. So that's why I'll be changing the release date, hopefully. So I hope you'll watch that one when it comes out. And at least for this one, I hope you enjoyed it. And if you didn't, then I still hope you learned something. So see ya.